Well, this one took its sweet time, didn't it? So I was basically on track for getting this video done in the same vein as the Game Pass July 2023 video, until something happened that prevented me from doing any more work on it. I started playing Baldur's Gate 3. And by the time I managed to break myself free from that, it was already halfway through September and I started doing a master's degree, which started eating up all of my free time. Also, shout out to Neymar and Viva for saving my neck editing a bunch of videos while I do smart stuff. But I'd still gotten a good way into writing and recording my views on all these games from August 2023, and I still wanted to publish my thoughts on them, mainly out of spite for the many series I've tried and failed to start over the years. The main problem now, though, is how can I get people interested in games released in one very very specific bygone month, some of which being released several years ago, released on a non-Steam subscription app that barely f**k it. Top 10 list. Haha, <laughs> major click. It was jolly convenient too that we had 10 games come out this month, if you count my promised carryover of Venba, and don't count Call of the Wild Angler, which, come on, it's a fishing simulator. What do you want me to say? They turned all those fishing mini games into its own full game. It, 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 it Finch. I also will be counting games that were added on cloud gaming this month, since when I checked, each of them already existed on main Game Pass already in some capacity, thank god. And before I start, I just want to stress that the main takeaway from this shouldn't be that higher game good, lower game bad. Because truth be told, every game this month was a good game. Hell, I'd even say it was a better overall month than July was, and I'd even consider most of the games in this list to be great games. So it was difficult to put a lot of them above one or the other. And at the end of the day, this is my opinion, and I do recommend checking out every game in this list. Just some slightly more than others. Just one of the many bizarre crimes later known as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, you know gaming reached its peak in 2023 when the recently released game expects itself to be bugged. Guess we're all beta testers now, lads. Alright, so the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a team-based PvP multiplayer cat and mouse in a similar vein to Dead by Daylight. While playing as part of the classic horror movie, you can either play the victims, who are all trying to escape the kidnapper's house and secret dungeons, or the family, who are all working to prevent them from escaping. So it all really plays out like a hide and seek, which prioritizes stealth for the victims with plenty of different crawl spaces and dangly objects that make noise and alert those more obsessed with the idea of a family than Vin Diesel with a corona. All the family have to hunt them down and uh, feed blood to the grandpa who will grant them all extra abilities for fighting the victims. Some Somehow. My only explanation for this is that the Psycho Lumberjack family are all vampires, and this is now my official headcanon. Each playable character on either side has their own unique playstyle, although it looks like you'll have to experiment with them out in the field because the game's tutorial consists of about 40 odd videos showcasing what each of them do, and I'm sorry, I'm definitely not going to watch all that. I just think it would be far more effective to just play each one offline or with bots to learn how to utilize them on a basic level before you take them in a match with people with the sense of either a bloodhound or a hobbit wearing a fancy ring. But anyway, let's get into the actual <laughs> gameplay. Gameplay wise, it does make for a very fun and tense game with all these killers or escapees on the loose who could be anywhere and plenty of well placed obstacles that can cause noise if you're not careful and a shortcut only certain characters can take advantage of that allows some victims a chance to make a break for it, or some killers a new way to close in on them. And after playing several matches, getting several kills, and even escaping one time, but Shadowplay didn't pick that clip up because holding sprint and my clipping button simultaneously turns my recordings off, I found myself having some good fun with this. Initially, I enjoyed playing the family at first, but ended up enjoying the victims more once I figured out the map layouts and where to escape and how to bloody go downstairs. So long as you don't get cornered in the basement straight away, and whether the family can actually find the way down there from the surface. Surface. It could be just as simple as beelining it out like a startled, slightly injured antelope, or waiting for them to go far enough away to get the exit unlocked. It may be something I haven't spotted, but it would be useful if the family could yell out if they found some victims, since my fellow psychopaths might be completely oblivious any of them have even been found. Though from my experience, 9 times out of 10 you get spotted, you may as well get it over and done with unless there's a very generous shortcut nearby and you're not being chased by the hitchhiker. But yeah, I realise I happen to place the multiplayer only game in last half. Uh -huh. But this game about your average Southern American cult is not bad at all. It's a good gory cat and mouse stealth game loosely based on the 1974 film that didn't actually turn out to be that buggy on my end personally. Maybe that message was more of a precautionary thing than anything, but I'm still mad that we've gotten to this point in gaming though. Now where did I put that chainsaw?
You know what? I think from that experience, Texas might be a little bit too scary. So let's leave that all behind and collect two of every sane person on Earth and head up to the skies and leave those hillbillies behind for good. Airborne Kingdom is another building and management game where this time your kingdom is flying up in the sky. Why? Because bordering off your land from hostile neighbors is far too complicated, that's why. It's essentially the premise of that Castle in the Sky anime from Studio Ghibli, now with an Arabian steampunk aesthetic, where your main goal is to eventually ally up with all 12 ground kingdoms and repopularize the flying machine. So with your kingdom, what now comprises of the second highest castle in the world outside Castle Wyvern, you now have unique challenges that face your floating kingdom, aside from dropping the occasional vomit bomb down below. All resources need to be collected from the ground, so agriculture is merely a trivial matter and someone else's problem. You need to constantly maintain your engine fuel or else you'll end up collapsing to the ground and wiping out the whole kingdom like that. Not too dissimilar to the current economy, as well as being careful that your building placement doesn't tilt the kingdom so much that it'll end up, at best, causing mild irritation with your populace, and at worst, capsizing the entire village. You know, Hover Kingdom stuff. It is relatively easy to keep a grip of the concepts and challenges it throws you as mentioned earlier, but you need to keep your kingdom's weight maintained as well as make sure your industrial factories aren't built in too close proximity to your houses. It's as easy as just keep all your residents on one side and industrial buildings on the opposite corner. The quests for allying up with kingdoms seem to be quite straightforward as well so far, usually coming down to bringing them this resource they want and now we're best friends. Although going back to resources, you'll have to find everything you need by looking around the landscape as opposed to mugging them on your map to make them a bit easier to find. They are all marked by giant words on the ground, like every region has its own Hollywood sign, the same way every Midwestern town has its own water tower, but it would be nice if it was easier to find the areas on the ground, at least where your workers are collecting resources to be able to reassign them to different jobs. They're only marked by a red balloon, and even then, it can be a little difficult to pinpoint exactly where they are in the entire 360 degree plane of field, especially when it gets really dark at night. In the end, I actually think this could be a decent entry-level game into the larger scale world of society management sims. You never need to worry about conflict and only really need to focus on quests and managing resources, storage, and population of your steadily evolving kingdom, as well as not placing buildings in the doo-doo places it wants you against. Definitely nothing groundbreaking, but still worth checking out. I have good news for anyone who plays on a low power potato PC or heaven forbid a Chromebook, because most of the games on the rest of this list are going to be either low poly or pixel games. And I'd also like to apologize to Devolver Digital for referring to them as Developer Digital by mistake in the July video. Whoops, silly me. Anyway, our first low graphic pixel adventure takes us on the charming adventures of great American freedom. Proforce is an absolutely ridiculous runner gun where you take control of various American heroes with numerous different weapons to free prisoners of war and liberate those lands that dare stand in the way of freedom, including Vietnam, Cambodia, Arstotska, and you do so with lots of bullets and lots more explosions. So as you play through each stage, you play through your variety of action blockbuster heroes based off of characters like Mr. T, John McClane, Neo Anderson, Agent J, The Terminator, and many others, plus the occasional civilian fighter who are, to put it one way, absolutely incompetent and all your bros all come with their own bro-based parody name and weapons and abilities unique to their character. And yes, while some definitely felt far more powerful than others, nobody ever felt so weak that they were downright unusable for the majority of the time. And what's interesting is that you don't ever get to choose who you play as. Your character gets randomized every time you respawn or set a new prisoner free throughout the journey, so you'll rarely stick with one character for very long, which allows you to experiment with the slightly different playstyles each hero brings and hold you from maining a certain bro, bro. On the whole, it's a fun little absurd run and gun that's essentially the Team America World Police video game equivalent, featuring undying patriotism and your favourite American icons only missing the founding fathers. Of course, the game runs on its exaggerated patriotism joke very heavily throughout the time, which runs risk of getting tired if played for too long, so I'd recommend hopping on every now and then to enjoy this silly fun to its fullest, though it was a missed opportunity not to incorporate Adrian Brody in some fashion. The pun was literally right there. Well, you can't say I'm not a man of my word. I know this game was technically added on July 31st, but it 
basically came out in August. So, as promised, Venba is a small debut indie game from Visai Games, set around a small Indian family who have migrated to Canada and are trying to get their lives together. In the meantime, the titular Venba takes pleasure in her mother's old Indian cookbook every now and then, which is where we come in and help cook up some of the recipes from the glory days. It's a very story-driven game, with a lot of time spent reading visual novelesque dialogue between our main characters, and player given choices that affect the plot about as much as an entire neighbourhood's worth of thoughts and prayers, but it's a well-grounded and well-paced story that offers great characterization, giving our characters very real and, for some people, relatable problems, tackling issues with family and cultural identity, which makes them very grounded and realistic people you can sympathise with. But you're probably interested in the cooking part of this game, and those sequences are actually pretty good when you get to them. The cooking portions are done almost like puzzles. Because the cookbook is so old, you're only given certain parts of the recipe, so you may end up getting certain parts of it wrong and end up starting again to fix your errors. It may involve some degree of trial and error in places, but there's always more or less enough to figure everything out on your own with what details are given. Although there's not actually that many cooking portions in the game, about five or six in total for the hour or so long story you're given. There's one later on as well where one character's gotten so refined that making dinner is suddenly about as difficult as clicking and dragging exactly where the game tells you to, with the answer sheet given straight out. I get what this is saying as part of the narrative, but it went on for a little too long for something with suddenly not much of a critical element. Maybe they could have slotted just one unfamiliar recipe for her at the end, just to spice it up a little, pun intended. I was getting an awful gut feeling that this would be the final level, but thankfully it wasn't, and while there wasn't a massive amount of cooking sequences and I wish I could have gotten more out of it, there was still enough that left me satisfied enough by the end of it. Either way, that is pretty much just a nitpick on what is a charming little short game. The art style is wonderfully done, the soundtrack is fitting and pleasant to listen to, and it's definitely a great little story about a fallen family with themes of trying to fit into a new country that's a pleasant way to spend an hour or two. Though if you do know how to cook Indian cuisine or understand Tamil, you've basically unlocked yourself a massive cheat code. The funny thing about this game is that I could have sworn this left Game Pass not that long ago, but now we can get the chance to actually play this thing. On Steam for me, however, since I didn't think I'd get a chance again on Game Pass. Oh well, guess that's what you get from gaming subscription apps. Anyway, Firewatch tells us the story of Henry, and quite literally walks us through his time as a Firewatch lookout at a national park in Wyoming, wherein the Watchman quickly becomes the Watched. It's a very story-heavy open-world walking simulator as you stroll around the open park, explore its mysteries, and do whatever your totally just a friend on the radio is telling you to do. Well, whether or not you see her in that way depending on your dialogue options. Yes, like before, this is indeed another game with varying dialogue options on how you, yes you, would like to respond to conversations. And how do they affect the outcomes? Well, without giving too much away, mainly cosmetically. I know the devs have stated that the game is meant to be less linear than people say it is, but the story never once dramatically changes its course, and the characters simply may or may not reference something that you might have already said before returning to the predetermined script. Not to undermine how impressive that kind of stuff is, I never thought tossing a stereo into a lake would haunt me with paranoia so much. Gameplay wise, you walk, and you jump, and you occasionally climb, and that's about it. But the main appeal of these walking sims is immersion into the story, and this is one that actually did a pretty good job for the most part. Those varying dialogues I mentioned earlier, while inconsequential in the super grand scheme, did succeed in making this a more personal experience with how you want to play Henry out to be, whether he be flirty or sarcastic or just not overly talkative, while also keeping true with the character he already is. The characters in general all felt authentic and huge kudos to the voice actors for a terrific job with their excellent portrayals. Although I'll admit that the whole plot about the Goodwins never really drew me in until near the end where it suddenly becomes very important. I was a little bit more concerned about who was smart enough to gather so much information from my totally just a friend and I, and what happened to those two troublemakers we encountered at the start. I guess that's what you get where a game about not really being alone is set in Wyoming of all places. Quake, 
Just as we were starting to lack in first-person shooters for this month, Bethesda out of nowhere decided to shadow drop a remaster of Quake 2, one of the old granddaddies of the genre faithful to its old look and feel, packed with all of its expansions, ports, and even brand new content. I'll preface right now that I've never actually played any Quake games before, so I will be going into this purely as a first-timer, but long story short, in the original Quake, you've been invaded by an alien race known as the Strahd, and the human military has been sent to the invaders' homeworld in order to strike back against them, and what follows is the classic fast-paced don't-you-dare-slow-down secret goody-hiding shooter you would find straight out of the 90s. It still keeps a lot of outdated, old-timey features such as one single loud jumping grunt from the player character, and low-res 3D graphics you couldn't mistake for any other era, and aim down sights is merely an afterthought, where you can simply use right mouse button as a secondary way to jump. But rest assured, I still love these inclusions. It keeps this classic Quake game grounded into what it was by retaining its feel with all its old quirks and cheesy features that they wouldn't dare make in most AAA shooters these days, which are still perfectly functional since they don't classify as complete jank. But with that being said, the Escape from 1997 does still feel very dated in the less good ways too, not least with its samey environments, dull grey and brown colouring acting as the game design equivalent of gruel, literally everywhere, and gameplay that does admittedly get repetitive after a while, but I suppose that's just the game we got over 26 years ago. What's important to look at here is what they've done as a remaster, and all I can say is, if any game deserved to be subtitled Definitive Edition, it is literally this. Again, sticking true to the look and feel of the original, they have updated models, lighting, included every playable version of Quake 2, from the Reckoning and the Ground Zero expansions, to the exclusive N64 version, Version, fully re-rendered cutscenes and unseen concept art, as well as playable levels from the E3 showcase of this game the year it came out. But that's not all. They also have their brand new expansion level, Call of the Machine. And all I have to say is, well, this expansion is excellent. The level design off the bat feels far more modern, and has way more interesting locations outside of the boring brand mud rectangles from before. And even then, it still feels at home in the Quake universe. It's paced brilliantly with all its enemies handing out weapons to you like an all-you-can-eat buffet, offers a steep challenge that forces you to utilize an arsenal you'd otherwise consider overpowered, and even lets you fight Emmanuel Macron and his sons. Overall, even if the base game is still quite outdated by a lot of today's standards, this is still a highly faithful updating of a classic FPS title that absolutely sets the bar high on how to remaster a game. And even if you don't use Game Pass, it only costs under 10 quid to get every piece of content ever made and more from this single game, and is simply a free update if you already happen to own it on Steam. Between this game and Baldur's Gate 3, it makes me happy to see games favouring art and the consumer in recent months, especially after some of the tripe we've dealt with in this previous year. Limbo, limbo, limbo like me. Well, have I got even more good news for any users with rigs about as powerful as a Chromebook? Because now we have nothing but easy to run, graphically undemanding games at our disposal. The only downside of this one is that it's not exactly for those who are squeamish, or dislike a heavy creepy atmosphere or big hairy spiders. So Limbo harkens back to the humble old days of the Xbox Live Arcade, and showcases a small boy who somehow wandered off and found himself deep inside a big dark forest, where he may as well be nothing more than a tiny insect, because pretty much everything from giant bugs to industrial machinery is out to kill him. Navigating this world is extremely simple, in that you just keep running to the right, and remember to jump and grab things whenever something might kill you, such as dipping your head even partially under water for a split second. That is until some brain slug forces you to run to the left instead because you are now a rebel without cause. Throughout your time here, this game sets a very bleak and often depressing tone. There is no colour to be seen anywhere, and it does an excellent job of making you feel like a small and weak morsel. Like you are now the prey, and the predator is the world. Every time you die, it slowly zooms in for a prolonged amount of time onto your pathetic corpse, just to show off what you have become. And yet, somewhere in the back of your mind, there is still that small sense of hope that you can make it out of this place as you steadily progress, and that little bit of power that you can find a way to overcome this obstacle that's preventing you from reaching such salvation somewhere just off camera. Or maybe it's just that brain slug again. 
there's not too much more to say about this one really. It's a short classic from the XBLA days that, if you have any interest in Little Nightmares, is well worth running right to. Although what I'd like to know is how this child managed to get this far from home and survived in the first place. Well I'm on my way. I don't know where I'm going. And now let's take a break from all that death and suffering and big hairy spiders, and embrace the complete polar opposite in tones. Because if one game about hiking all around an open park wasn't enough, there's two we can now enjoy, with far less stalker syndrome. A Short Hike offers the story of Claire, a penguin who has undertaken the task of hiking up to the summit of Hawk Peak Provincial Park, in order to pick up some phone reception because she's awaiting a very important phone call. That or she's feeling the pain of the modern day games industry. It is, once again, a very simple game that sends you to this 3D hub of a plethora of different paths and hiking trails, where numerous other animals are dotted about doing their own thing and asking Claire for help, a trope of video games so common where NPCs can't stop asking the only main character for help whenever they so much as utter a friendly hello, that I am now going to dub this trope the Waiter's Curse. But the game still has an absolutely wonderful charm about it as you explore around each and every corner and crevice of the park, and definitely brings this feeling of being on holiday or vacation to a beautiful national park with its natural wilderness, beaches, hills, and its titular hiking trails, and the side quests I actually feel truly motivated to stick with, like suddenly getting enticed by this beach stick ball game, with this penguin I found on the opposite side of the island by complete accident. The only issue I have with this game is that I'd like an easier way to keep track of all the quests and objectives I've been given, and where I can hand them in, especially with all the tasks you get given to do at once, but everybody is scattered somewhere on this island and you can't really seem to find them all the time. Perhaps putting the quests on a separated map window would help, as to not clutter the beautiful main UI of this game. But yeah, on the whole, this game is an absolutely astounding journey. From getting invested in all of the NPC stories around the park, all the way to that 10 out of 10 climax where you just glide down the entire mountain you've spent the last two hours scaling up. And is one of those games I cannot recommend enough for a cutesy, relaxy, easy to learn and charming game which you love to see on Game Pass. What's that? I need to obtain 7 golden feathers to climb this face do I? Well f you, I only needed 6! And so we reach the big grand RPG released in August of 2023 by a dedicated indie studio that would go on to receive multiple nominations at the Game Awards. That wasn't Baldur's Gate 3. Yet still managed to be talked about for longer than that other subsequent big RPG to come out. But speaking of stars, Sea of Stars is a simplistic JRPG that promises to both return to the classic era of the genre, very much akin to Chrono Trigger, and blend it with some more modern elements of the genre. The story centers around Zael and Valerie, sorry I mean Valia, who are two young solstice warriors fresh out of training who are going on a quest to live up to their full potential and help boost their old friend in the culinary industry. The presentation is absolutely absolutely beautiful, from the music to the artwork and even the odd animated segments. And simply put, the gameplay feels fast and fluent wherever I go, whether it be in combat or just exploring around the map. I love each of the powers the characters have and see them on display, and I want to learn more about this world I am exploring. Of course, the combat is all turn-based, so you have to pick whether or not you want to poke the demon, cast a spell on them, or stop to have a picnic mid-fight, but also adds extra elements like parrying, inflicted, and taken damage, as well as another system where specific types of attacks and spells can be used to counter an enemy's defense, encouraging you to think on the spot and plan ahead about what specific type of attack you should use, which goes on to encourage you to actually utilize most of them instead of just sticking to an old reliable. It's not super essential to pull them off every time, granted you don't exactly have that many moves at all, which becomes more apparent the further you get into the game, especially when some enemy attack combos appear near impossible to deal with because you you only get one sword wielder, but again, it helps create variation in actual strategizing during these encounters, It creates a fun new gameplay loop that makes every combat encounter feel unique and incredibly satisfying to pull off, which make it a rightfully standout game from 2023. The one real complaint I have for this game, shocking I know, is that while the designs of the two main characters, Valir and Zael, are brilliant and I enjoy being around them enough, the same can't really be said about their personalities unfortunately. They're not bland 
hand per se, but they are very inoffensive and by the books, and for the most part show little character motivation other than finishing their trials, or like they're supposed to, like it's their only purpose in life. Ironically, it's the third wheel of the group that keeps any interactions interesting outside of the formal commodities and dialogue. He always seems to be the one who becomes the diplomat with the NPCs, while our two main characters just occasionally nod their heads in the background. Sometimes I wonder what the game would be like if he was our main character, who somehow reunited with these two warrior monks from his childhood, and is trying his best to fit his way into their now drastically different world from the outside. Either way, they're all still enjoyable to be around, and I will send for my Queen Valyria absolutely shamelessly. With that being said, this game is definitely a fantastic modern take on a classic JRPG with a familiar look and feel, and modern techniques to spruce up its older features and masters its core gameplay loop, which is all enough to make it deservedly the second most talked about RPG this summer, depending on your perception of when the summer ended. If I had a nickel for every game from this month that had low graphics and featured a female protagonist bent on climbing to the top of a mountain, I would have two nickels, which isn't a lot because it's a dead form of currency now. But that aside, Celeste is a side-scrolling 2D platformer where you play as Madeline, who, hey, it's another one from Canada, who decides to climb all the way to the top of the perilous Celeste Mountain. Like, you don't understand, she really, really needs to climb this mountain. Oh yeah? It can't be that bad, right? Alright, let's not be coy about it. This game freaking rocks, and I love it to bits. It's one of those Metroidvania platformers where you traverse a series of rooms one after the other, utilizing various abilities you pick up as you go, which are taught to the player perfectly. It leaves you with the right amount of knowledge on it from the get-go, while also leaving you enough room to try something out with each move, and discover for yourself how to take advantage of it in order to progress, and sometimes gain optional collectible strawberries on the way. Why are there fresh ripe strawberries on this abandoned mountain where old buildings are falling apart and are possibly haunted? I don't know, they're just there and I want them. It's also important to know that this is, by design, a very difficult game, so you can expect to die. A lot. It has that influence of Super Meat Boy in climbing 2D walls rapidly and the oh so much dying for messing one single thing up, but it offers you the perfect amount of challenge and balance of checkpoints that really makes you want to beat it. Sometimes you might even repeat a section so many times that you end up finding out that you could actually go a shorter way to get past one of the trickier parts. Only then it turns out getting into said shortcut is tricky in of itself. And something else this game also succeeds in is giving so much heart to develop the character of Madeline as you learn more and more about her and her motivations as the game goes on, pits her alongside some very quirky characters on her journey, brilliantly follows through themes of anxiety, and gives us some genuinely emotional and brilliant moments later on, which I won't spoil, but seeing her character develop honestly feels like a whole other reward for completing each chapter in the best possible way. That's basically my summary of this game, and why I've decided it's my number one game, other than it's so good and please do play if any of what I described sounds slightly appealing to you. Even long after finishing writing this section of the review, it was the one game I wanted to carry on playing to completion in my own time over any other game in this list. However frustratingly angry I might get at the endless dying. Also, trans rights. In memorial to those who died climbing the mountain, you say? <laughs> Guess those suckers didn't have infinity respawns like I did. <laughs>